interface with you. Okay. The computer? Okay. It's okay. We start. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are now ready to start with our weekly media briefing. Uh, we have had to delay while waiting for the president uh, to finish speaking, as we know. He is at the, in the Eastern Cape. Uh, so we are now going to start with our briefing. And without any further waste of time, I would like to call upon the premier to come and speak to you. Uh, and as we have always done, once the Premier has spoken, we will take questions from the media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tabo. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen from the from the media, uh, we're going to give you our weekly update. Uh, let me just say from the beginning that uh, I am uh, not going to cut my hair in solidarity with uh, the, the salons, uh, those businesses that are, are not yet uh, open. Uh, so just tolerate me for, for a while. I see some of you are actually shaving uh, quite uh, consistently. I have an option of uh, doing it myself, but I, I support this, the small business people who are doing uh, this work and in solidarity with the women as well. Uh, who are really, really struggling because uh, the sector is not, is not open. We're ho looking forward to when the sector is open, is compliant and everything uh, of that sort. So what we're going to do is to take you through. Uh, as you know, we have uh, delayed because we were waiting for the president to, s to speak we don't want to be speaking at the same time with uh, our president who are speaking in the, in, the, in the Eastern Cape. I'm going to take you through our update in terms of the health response. Uh, you know uh, what we, we call the comprehensive health response. Uh, I don't, it's, uh, I don't see the slides moving. My apology. So let's go st straight. You know our pillars, uh, those pillars. Uh, the key thing today we want to focus on, we're not going to deal with all the others. It's just our health response. We are entering a, a new phase. Um, all of us listened to the, the president also last night. But we are basically in level four. Uh, what is happening in level four? Uh, no, guys, I think uh, there's a problem with, with this. Can I, can I get the computer back? Somebody should. So these are the national, the national numbers as you have them. Uh, 
They were announced by the minister last night. Gauteng province, uh, uh, give, give me a minute. I can see that somebody's moving the slides. Uh, Just give us a minute. Someone removed the computer here, and now we're struggling. This, this. Yeah, I, I think we must switch off. Uh, yes. My, my sincere apology. There's too much creativity uh, in the ranks. Just bring back the computer. So the national figures as announced yesterday, uh, we all have them. Uh, you would see, I think what we want to highlight is that uh, uh, since patient zero in Gauteng, patient zero was the 7th of, of March. That's when we had uh, the first positive case in Gauteng. You would recall that there was a period where 50% of the cases were more than 50% of the cases, positive cases, were in our province. Uh, over the last uh, two months of the evolution of the pandemic, uh, you would see that uh, in terms of the confirmed cases, 17%, uh, 17.7% 17 of those are in Gauti. The active cases, the number of active cases are even fewer uh, in the national sense. 10.7% uh, of the national active cases uh, are in Gauteng. Um, which means, and this is important for us, which means that if you look at where we started two months ago, when people say the lockdown does not work, the story, the narrative in Gauteng is the lockdown has worked for us. This is extremely important. There was a period where the number of cases per day were 42, 42 cases per day on average. Uh, and as we track uh, the number of cases per day uh, on average uh, has uh, dropped uh, quite significantly. So we give you again the breakdown. The critical issue is when we briefed you last week, so just in seven days, uh, the breakdown of of positive cases, recoveries, uh, as well as active cases. I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, a week ago, on the, on the day, on the Thursday when we briefed you, the recoveries in Johannesburg were 64%. Uh, in Ekuruledi, the recoveries were 74%. In Swani, they were 45%. In Sidibeng, the recoveries were 35%. So where are we this week? A week later, the recoveries in Johannesburg are 84%. Uh, so 84% of the cases in Johannesburg are now recovered. Uh, in Ekuruleni, they, they are 80%. Uh, Ekuruleni, a week ago, had the highest number of recoveries. And when the highest number of recoveries are in Johannesburg, and there are fewer number of cases, active cases in Johannesburg. It's because Johannesburg is the epicenter uh, of uh, COVID-19. So that's something we always look, look at and, and say, what, how many new cases do we still have in each region, but uh, in particular in Johannesburg, when we currently we have 167 uh, active cases out of 1,124 cases. 
and we have 948 uh, recoveries, which uh, is important. Of course, we have lost uh, 24. By now, we have 24 people who have passed on, um, and may their souls rest in peace. Uh, may their families uh, be comforted. We convey our condolences uh, to their families. This includes uh, uh, one of our professional health care uh, workers, uh, Dr. Mini. Uh, Dr. Mini was working with uh, our Department of Health. Uh, he was chairing the medical aid schemes, but he was also working with the, uh, the province. Uh, we convey our condolences to all those who are departed to their families. Uh, again, there's another way of looking at provincial data. Uh, if you look at where we were last week, we had 61% recoveries. Uh, a week later, we have 74% recoveries. Uh, last week, we had uh, 15 deaths when we last did uh, the update. We now have 24. Uh, so the mortality rate was 0 0.9 last week, Thursday, and now it is at 1.1%. Uh, it has moved up. Uh, a bit the active cases uh, have have dropped and again this is important uh, that we must have fewer active cases because uh, this helps us to plan our, our next interventions when we have fewer active cases we look at where they are uh, send our teams to make interventions in those areas uh, to ensure that this, they, they don't they don't spread uh, the infections to others and those they've interacted with. So we share with you, uh, seven days ago, we had a 13% increase in recovery rate. Um, and then uh, now we have a 13% decrease in active cases uh, a week later. And this is uh, important for, for us. More recoveries. Uh, fewer active cases. It's, a, it's an important story. And that's a function of how many infections are happening every day. So again, we want to share with you the graph. We always, again, you, you see that uh, the, the curve is inclining. It's going up. Uh, but it is not doing so steeply. The curve of positive cases is, is going up. It has been going up steadily. But you would see the, the recovery is, is a, that curve on the recoveries. The one we want to be steep is the recoveries. And the one we want to see declining is the number of active cases. And, and you'd see essentially in this, on this uh, slide, we show you that there are two positive things happening. Uh, the active cases are reducing uh, whilst the recoveries are increasing at a rate that is much higher, given where we come from as a province. We always want to say to you, uh, where were we in March? There was a period where the pandemic was concentrated principally here. More than 50% uh, percent of the cases were concentrated here uh, in our province. So, so what is new today, which we want to share with you, is that we have also been looking at uh, COVID-19, uh, the, first, the first period of March, uh, going into April, what are the important trends, uh, and want to say to you, essentially, we are observing what we call the changing geography of the hotspots. Uh, what do we mean by this? So in, in the early stage of the pandemic outbreak in Gauteng province, what is the early stage? From patient zero, that's the 7th of March, to the lockdown, essentially, uh, on the 27th of March. What is it we were dealing with? Uh, at that time, there were very few uh, known cases in the townships because most of the cases were concentrated around what we called the triangle, essentially because they were imported cases 
It was from O.R. Tambo International. Uh, there, there would be the Centurion connection towards Swani, uh, come back to Santen Four Ways area, the significant concentration of cases there. In fact, uh, that, was, that was our big hotspot, uh, essentially. If Johannesburg was the epicenter, in Johannesburg, the, the epicenter was the Santen Four Ways area. Uh, in, the, in the early days, in that first uh, uh, period in March, and we began to saw cases coming in the, so from mid-rent to, um, from four ways to mid-rent. In Ekurule, in Bedford View was the critical place where most of the cases were concentrated. Uh, so the triangle, uh, so in the period before April, the triangle that was the big area of concern for us was O.R. Tambo, the arrivals, international arrivals, a lot of those people who were arriving there who would be, when tested, would, would, we would find that it's people who come from the Centurion uh, area, the Santen Four Ways area, the Bedford View area, essentially in the three metros. Fewer cases in other areas. So what we called hotspots uh, a month and a half ago uh, are changing, and we are going to share with you uh, the geospatial mapping of where the active cases are and where the new cases are coming. Uh, so essentially, this, the cases were concentrated in the suburbs, and very few cases were in the townships. It's obvious, the explanation is obvious. Uh, a lot of the people who are people who, are, who, who were traveling all over the world, uh, well, well-to-do families, uh, people who involved in international business or involved uh, uh, in business that uh, allows them to travel. And at that time, so the work that was done by our health department was to deploy testing teams, tracing teams uh, to the hotspots of that period uh, to help track down. Firstly, once it is known so-and-so has tested positive, all their contacts would be, would be traced in those areas. Again, a lot of the contacts would be concentrated uh, in the suburban areas. In some instances, there would be people from the townships who are working in particular businesses who had become contacts of those who had traveled. Uh, for example, the Alexandra case that got us to go to Alexandra was somebody who worked uh, in a company uh, who, had, who was a contact of uh, someone who had traveled. But the point, again, is to emphasize that in the early stage of COVID-19 outbreak in Gauteng, it is principally the focus and the main concentration of the cases were in the suburbs. So our tracing teams, uh, our testing teams focused on that. Uh, and in that period, so just the period before April, uh, we, we're sharing with you here a map now, this is the geo mapping of cases in wards, in different wards uh, in Gauteng province. Uh, so what you would see there is, so the bigger the dot, the higher the density of uh, cases and contacts. So you can see, when we say Johannesburg, well, there was, continues to be, but it was, even from the beginning, the epicenter. You see the dots in Johannesburg are bigger, and those dots tell you basically that there are more cases uh, in certain areas. They are concentrated, again, you go back to the areas we are referring to, the suburbs. Uh, the hub of those suburbs is Santen, the neighboring areas uh, around Santen, and there may have been few cases in this area or in that area, and those dots are smaller you would see there would be a dot as small as uh, in Thunder Bay. There would be few cases there in, the, in those uh, early periods, that is before April. And 
And then already you would see that there would also be areas in, uh, of, in townships uh, where there may have been one or two cases. I want to show you in the next map what has happened since April. So February, I mean March, April, and where are we now in May? What's happening with this density of cases, what we call the shifting geography of the hotspots. In other words, the hotspots are not uh, just in one place. So we share with you the overview here is, again, I'm saying to you this is our Houghton City Region Observatory, which is a research institution. They work with government, these academics from universities in Houghton, especially Vets University and uh, UJ. They work with us. They do all kind of work. They do surveys. They are the ones who did this mapping, geospatial mapping for us. So, so we, and this is just now looking at data at a granular level, at what level to say. So what's happening in the various words? Where were we in March uh, at the early outbreak of the pandemic? And where are we now? You know, overall, our numbers are increasing every day. Uh, we are happy that they are increasing at a lower rate. But you need to know that in the areas, uh, the new hotspots, and this is what uh, this map is showing you. So can, you can see in the map that, uh, so the darker the color, it means the more the cases are and the bigger the dot. These red dots uh, are in words in Gauteng, uh, firstly in Johannesburg. When you say Johannesburg uh, remains the epicenter. So here we are talking about all the cases, all the confirmed cases. That includes the ones that are no longer active. We're just taking Gauteng has got uh, 2,074 cases, so where are those cases? Which wards are they? And this map shows you that there's a big difference between March, that is before April and after April. And what is the essential storyline that's emerging from here? So we still have in the northern suburbs of Johannesburg, if Johannesburg is still the epicenter and it's still we still have the largest density of numbers in some areas uh, in Johannesburg, like Bryanston, Hoodmead. Uh, that's part of the greater Santin area. That includes four ways. But remember that we've just indicated the number of recoveries in, jo in Johannesburg, especially in what used to be the early hotspots. The number of recoveries are high, but those recoveries are still recorded the way all cases are recorded, they are amongst the confirmed cases. They are concentrated there. So in this map, what is important is to see that there are also clear signs of emerging hotspots. So there's the hotspots we have always had in specific areas, but there are emerging hotspots. And where are these emerging hotspots? COVID-19 is in the townships. This is the message we want to convey. Uh, people, our people in the townships shouldn't think that COVID-19 is not for them. It's somewhere else. Some areas which we want to highlight here where the numbers are still lower because we're coming from a low base, but in the townships, even if you have 40 cases, it's a lot because they can, the transmission can happen from 40 in a short space of time to huge numbers if there is no intervention. And if people, the behavior of our people in these areas is not changing, if we don't make certain interventions, you could have infections of people at a large scale. So, so we are sharing with you the information that says they are emerging. The case numbers are still, are still low, but they are Every day when we look at the data that is coming, we are also looking because we are particularly concerned about the townships being the most vulnerable areas and the informal settlements. So, even, so someone may ask a question. 
they, you are saying that they, they are emerging hotspots. The numbers are still low, but remember, they can, they can multiply in the shortest space of time if there's no social distancing, if all the other measures that we are going to, to explain to you that we, we, are, we are working feverishly on the ground to make sure these measures are in place, and we need buy-in of communities. We need community participation. So the areas where we are seeing these cases emerging so parts of Soweto, and there are specific wards in Soweto, Orange Farm, Alexandra, uh, Kwatema, uh, Tembisa, Ivory Park, Soshanguve, Enedale in the south of Johannesburg. Uh, Van der Bale Park is, is amongst the, no, the CBDs, basically. Uh, it's, pu it's put there. Uh, in, uh, inaccurately, but it is the CBDs. Van der Bale Park, we are seeing cases there that are increasing. They may be still be fewer, but remember, for us, we can't wait when we see now there are cases emerging in a particular area. Pretoria West. Pretoria West is part of the, sub, uh, the CBD uh, of Tswani, the areas in Pretoria West, we are seeing significant activity of cases that are coming in there. Uh, so essentially, this is what we call the shifting geography or the changing geography of hotspots. The hotspots that were the hotspots in the early phases of the pandemic in the suburbs those areas, yes, we still have cases. They are cooling. We have lots of recoveries in those areas. We now have a, multi, a significant number of cases that are emerging every day. What's the usefulness of this? The usefulness of looking at this every day, this is data and intelligence to help inform where do we direct our tracing teams, our testing efforts, including quarantine interventions and isolation interventions. And so this is not a new approach. I've heard stories from people who are not as informed, who are not as close to the way we work in our province, who say in Gauteng, they are just testing everywhere. There, there's no targeted areas. They are not focusing on the hotspots. The people who are saying that must focus on their own problems and not focus on... Uh, 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 we, are fo we have always focused on the hotspots. We have always directed our tracing and testing efforts to the hotspots. But the hotspots are changing. And as the hotspots are changing and new hotspots are emerging, we are redirecting our tracing, testing efforts, and other interventions to those areas. Uh, which are emerging new hotspots. Uh, and I want to explain, we will not wait until there are a thousand cases, especially in the townships, because of the potential impact of this, what, the, the potential impact of one case in a township that is densely populated could be deadly in terms of the, the, the spread of the infection. So we are not waiting until there are big cluster outbreaks. So yes, you saw yesterday one of the things we did was to go to uh, areas like Soshanguve, Ivory Park, uh, areas like Alexandra. We are informed by this data. We are looking at the additional new cases that have been coming out of that area. And one of the, go the good things I can share with you is that uh, or in these emerging hotspots, the positive cases have been I identified through testing. Uh, the contacts also have been identified. The work is going on. Uh, we, were, we were doing tests also in Soshanguve yesterday, but there are people in Soshanguve who have already been who had tested positive and their contacts identified. There are people in, in Ivory Park who had tested positive, their contacts identified. And I want to say also that one of the incidents we picked up in Ivory Park was, an, was that the pandemic, the cluster 
the source of the outbreak was a factory in Centurion. Uh, and in that factory, there were people who were working in the factory who were living in Ivory Park, who live in Ivory Park. And that's how the pandemic spread from the factory uh, in the township. Ivory Park, you will see in the map we are going to show you today. Uh, Ivory Park is a map that's much green, that, I mean, more red, densely red. This, this is our color coding. You will see it's dark red. You will see uh, that in the sequencing, it is an area of high vulnerability and, and emerging hotspots that requires all kind of multifaceted interventions to ensure we don't end up with huge, huge numbers in those uh, areas. Those interventions is about testing, is about tracing of contacts, uh, and, and I can tell you there are people who have moved out of Ivory Park already who are in quarantine because they can't uh, self-isolate. Uh, I'm giving an example of Ivory Park, but the work that our health team is doing is in all these emerging hotspots in the townships. So when you see us intensively testing uh, in a, like uh, on over the weekend, we were in Deep Slot is because we have detected a case there. We have tracked down all the, uh, or we are tracking down all the contacts in the area. We have tested people. We are awaiting the results. All the contacts uh, are, eyes are moved out of their families because otherwise it will cause more problems. And and. The critical issue about this uh, emerging hotspots is that there are where large numbers of people live. Uh, and they will put, that's where the potential for putting lots of pressure on our health uh, services would be. So I'm also sharing with you today a slide that shows what has happened in a number of wards. So this information we were sharing with you, you would see. Uh, the awards in the suburbs where at the early stage of the pandemic, there was a spike in the number of cases. And they stabilized after the lockdown. This is what these graphs are showing you here. After the lockdown, uh, those cases stabilized. There was the flattening of the curve in wards. We are tracking the curve in wards as well, at ward level, not just what's happening in the municipality. We are tracking that. And you would see in April, there was a spike again. The, you know, the, the curve moved up in some of those wards. And then there are wards in, the, in some of the townships, what, what I was referring to you earlier on. And these are townships, including CBDs, uh, uh, like the Uoville, Uoville Beria, uh, area, uh, Yeoville, Hillbro, Beria area is one of those. We had had a significant spike early on and later the curve started to flatten. Uh, so what is important, and, and then you see there we're sharing with you also graphs around where we say Pretoria West is now an emerging hotspot. We're showing you What's happening with the graph in that area? Uh, the graph is spiking, is moving up. And in our case, even if there are five new cases in an area, five new cases is five a lot. When we look at the nature of the ward, the nature of the settlement and the density of people there and how easy an infection can happen, it, we kick into action. So this, in relative numbers terms, someone asked me a question, but uh, Premier, you are saying Soshanguve is becoming an emerging hotspot or Ivory Park, how many cases? If we have 40 cases in Soshanguve, it's 40 cases too much because those 40 cases can multiply in the shortest space of time. Uh, given the vulnerability of the area uh, from all indicators, densities, but also the access to health services 
and food security. I think I've taken a, a bit of time to explain to you the, the logic and the science of mapping these areas as emerging hotspots. It's not for its own sake. It's to intervene ahead of time, to intervene before the numbers overwhelm us, to tread down those who may be source of infections, before the numbers are too many. And that's how we have been able to contain the pandemic outbreak in some of the early hotspots, was early intervention, track down people. One case may be one case too many. If you don't find one contact, that one contact may be one contact too dangerous because they may infect another 50 people who will go and infect uh, others. Uh, uh, also given the theory of uh, that it's not just the, those who have symptoms, there are others who, who carry the virus, but they would not uh, really show. So we share with you also, this is the curve in Gauteng in the last seven days. Uh, you would see coming from the period of March, we once shot up. We came down after the lockdown in April. Uh, you saw that uh, our curve was going up. Uh, it came down again towards the end of April, a substantial uh, decline uh, in the number of cases per day. Uh, it is going up uh, every day, uh, although at, at a steady rate. Uh, you'd see there, it's, uh, it, uh, we are concerned even if we are able to get only 30 people a day, which sometimes what the rate has been, uh, the following day we get 60 people, uh, the other day we get less. We are concerned, and it is known, the science of COVID is that you will not really stop uh, the infections. All you can do is uh, put in place measures of managing it, uh, slowing it down as the lockdown has done, uh, and ensuring that you take action as quickly as you can. So, again, an important information we are sharing with you is that in Gauteng province, we, we geo-map we geo we geo various areas of Gauteng, the townships, the wards, the suburbs, in terms of what is called the vulnerability and risk index. This is an index developed by our Houghton City Region Observatory. The level of risk always has to do uh, with, because COVID-19 is transmitted through contacts, so where you have high densities, public transport system, high density human settlements, the risk is higher. Where you have larger families, intergenerational families, there are more people living in one household, the risk is higher. That's what the risk index deals with. Uh, whereas, as you know, the middle class people, the, the, the risk profile would be different in the suburbs. There are fewer people living together. Uh, the, the, the potential for, for isolation and social distancing is better. The other important area of risk is the potential for high social distancing in the townships is very, very low. And essentially, it's very, very difficult to social distance. So that's the risk profile. We do this risk profile to know which areas, if we were to have an outbreak in that area of larger infections, how many people do we, would we be faced with having to move out into quarantine facilities? Then take the risk with the vulnerability. So we say well, there's the risk index, and there's the vulnerability index. Vulnerability has to do with how many people are poor. So if you're talking about these other factors I was talking about, about high density settlements, large families, large number of people living together, so normal day-to-day -day contact is high, take that with, with poverty, that the, the poverty level in those areas is high, and the access to health services in those areas is not at the same 
and including the number of people in those areas who can access better health care services. So issues of vulnerability, poverty levels, income, those who may not have income, levels of unemployment. So there's a relationship between the reason we are watching, literally watching the townships every day, every night, that in those areas we need to step up in a way above what we would, we would do in the suburbs is risk, high risk, and high vulnerability of those areas. Large concentration of people, uh, and our healthcare services would not be able to cope ordinarily if the outbreak was to reach the level that uh, the epidemiologists have been uh, 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 saying it, we are heading in that direction. So we are using this, uh, the risk uh, index and the vulnerability index also to step up our interventions. But to also look at where do we need additional infrastructure. So when we talk about bed capacity, additional bed capacity, so all the infrastructure investments we are saying we are making, we are also informed by the vulnerability risk um, the vulnerability index and the high risk index in those areas, based also on population densities. So, how many beds do we already have uh, in Johannesburg in the Soweto area? That's why we are increasing the number of beds uh, at Chris Hani Baragwanath. We are, we are adding additional beds there, three, additional 300 beds. Uh, that's why we are adding additional beds in the George Mukari cluster in the north northern part of Tswani. That's why we are de adding additional beds also in Jubilee. Uh, that is why we are clearing the beds uh, at uh, Tswani District Hospital. Uh, it's already the map that shows us where are the cases, the potential of increase in the number of cases or a new hotspot emerging we must, we must match this with the, 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 the resource allocation. I will show you even in our interventions on food. So these maps are important. When we deal with food security, we are also informed already by where is vulnerability and where is the risk. Uh, so even in the slides dealing with food distribution, we have been mapping where the food is going versus where the greatest need is versus where the highest level of risk is, versus where the, the, vulnerable, the highest level of vulnerability is. So on this map, you would see Soshanguve, it's reddish. So those areas where you see on the map, they are lighter. It means that the risk, as well as vulnerability, taken together with the number of cases, the cases are still fewer, even though the level of risk and vulnerability is higher, but the cases are fewer. So, but when you look at the northern parts of Swan, you would see that Soshanguve is the area where the map is red, which means, yes, it's a high risk in terms of all the explanations I've given, but they, they, we are beginning to see more cases there. The combination of more cases and high risk and high vulnerability make us give color code that as an area that requires urgent intervention and urgent attention. From healthcare measures to food security interventions, as well as other interventions related to water and sanitation uh, and uh, uh, decongestion of, of people there. So you will also see Ivory Park is much darker, uh, and when the map it's much darker. It just tells you where more new cases are coming. I've just given you an explanation. New hotspots for us is a relative term. And new doesn't have to, have to be too many before we identify the actual risk that those uh, cases are posing on the rest of the area. So an intervention early. Uh, it's something that is much uh, appreciated. 
So having said that, some of the interventions, so what, do, what are we, in addition to testing and tracing, of providing food security and other interventions, so we go into these different areas to do what? To also do flu vaccinations. The immunization intervention so far in the province, 253,469 immunizations have been carried out. Whether it's in Deep Sluot or it's in Soshanguve, uh, you would see that in addition to just testing for COVID, you've got to deal with other, with other areas. We need to look at what's happening uh, with regard to those who are HIV positive because I think one of the feedback from our clinicians is that the, ter the most terrible mistake we can ever make is to neglect other other ailments and other people who are patients, who, some who have long-term uh, illnesses, communicable and non-communicable diseases, we must pay attention to the management of those as well as we deal with, with COVID. So that that issue of comorbidities, because that's an important issue, if we neglect the, the most vulnerable groups, so yes, there may be an area uh, again, I'll keep using Soshanguve and Ivory Park, an area of high risk and high vulnerability where cases are beginning to show. But in those areas also, we must pay attention when we intervene. We must pay attention to those vulnerable. The elderly people must be vaccinated. Flu vaccinations. And as I said, vaccine, flu vaccination is important. It's not going to stop COVID-19 uh, transmission or someone contracting COVID-19, but the flu vaccination as we go into winter will help boost the immune capacity, the immune systems of the vulnerable group, groups, the elderly, uh, women who are pregnant, the children, people who, are, who have TB and HIV and AIDS, uh, who are managed, where that is being managed. So that's a, our compli comprehensive uh, response, uh, including those with uh, who have other chronic illnesses. So this is an important thing to bear in mind. You're not just focusing on COVID-19, you must also intervene uh, uh, overall uh, to, to, to address the, the challenge that we may be facing. Uh, so we're sharing with you screening. Uh, screening, we have screened 3.4 million people. Uh, 3.4 million people is the screening that's happening outside the roadblocks that we did. You will see in the next in the slide that will follow later through the roadblocks how many people did we screen and how many did we test. So 3.4 million screening. We emphasize yes we should still do screening, but we are alive to the reality that uh, COVID-19 will have a lot of people who don't have. Uh, we don't have symptoms, so, so, but we still need to do screening. Uh, we are still doing screening uh, in that uh, we do screening in community. We do community screening. We do screening in our hospitals. We do screening in our primary health care facilities. We are also doing screening uh, in the correctional facilities. We're working very closely with the correctional services. Uh, the, the correctional services team meets with our team here, they are part of the, the war room so that we pay attention to that sector because the outbreak in that sector uh, has also caused uh, problems elsewhere. It has caused problems in the Eastern Cape. Uh, that's why it's an important sector for us. We pay attention to it. We don't want to wait until it is too late. Now, these are the latest figures on uh, testing. Uh, and I want to say to you, the source is the National Health Laboratory Services. Last week, we shared with you the breakdown of tests uh, conducted so far. You can see how ten still contributes 33% of the national test uh, being done, uh, and the rest of the provinces uh, uh, would come there. Uh, again, there's always a debate on the side about uh, who tests more. Uh, that, that's a useless debate, uh, to be frank. We don't want to enter that. We are worried about uh, saving lives. We are worried about uh, 
ensuring that anyone who tests positive does not infect more people. We are worried about trying to reduce the, the rate of infection to the extent uh, that uh, it happens. We don't want to be entering into a childish debate uh, about who is testing more. We're just giving uh, you the facts. The reality is that all of us must focus on the job. We must focus on uh, doing the best we can as a nation, not just one part of the, uh, the, the, the republic. We must look at everywhere. And death anywhere in the country, one person, one person who dies anywhere in the country is, is too many. That pain uh, is felt by all of us South Africans. We can't celebrate the, the, the increase in the number of deaths. We can't celebrate the increase in the number of infections anywhere. The country as a whole must respond. We need that level of maturity and not politicize this uh, as I often see, unfortunately, our counterparts in the Western Cape often want to politicize uh, this. We don't want to do that. Uh, we want to work, get marshaled by our president, uh, work. We learn from all the provinces where the infection rate is low, where the mortality rate is low. We also learn from all the provinces that are battling with the high infection rate and high mortality rate. We are learning in advance because who says it will not get here? Uh, we are learning and preparing all the time so that we can do our best uh, to ensure that uh, we save lives. Uh, we work with the people in our communities to save lives. So there's the petty politi politicking and petty squabbling about this is something really that's undesirable from where, from where we stand. Patients in our facilities, you will see there are 48 admitted patients. Last week when we, we were here, we had uh, two weeks ago, we had 72 patients. These numbers are shifting all the time. Last week we had 68, if, if I remember, 68. Now we have 48 patients admitted in our facilities. 39 of them are in the private ho hospitals Nine are in the public hospitals. Two of them are, are in ICU under ventilation. And we always watch those in ICU uh, very, very closely under ventilation or being oxygenated. We watch that because if there's, if there's the, next, the next death may occur, it is going to be coming uh, most likely out of those cases. So we look at that. The number of people in ICU for us is always something we watch uh, very closely uh, and, and also get feedback from the clinicians about what is it that they are doing when people are uh, either in ICU or in high care. Uh, that's something that uh, we look at uh, very closely. Uh, the breakdown of that you would see since the beginning of patients uh, zero, we have had 303 patients across the board in public and private facilities in Gaute. But out of that 303, 231 were discharged uh, uh, completely uh, from our facilities. Current uh, bed availabilities, the number is still the same. What we gave you last week, uh, 800, uh, 800, 800, 300, and 8,301. 8,301 beds, 8,301 beds. That's the number we have always had in the past two, two weeks. Uh, these are the beds in the private sector as well as in the public sector. And when we say they are ready, it means that should anyone need admission, that's the number we have. You know we have another capacity we are building and this we will always remind you every week. In addition to this, we are adding 1,600 beds. Uh, additional bed capacity. And these are the ones we are adding in our current uh, facilities. In one or two cases, we may have a, a field hospital, what we are doing at Nazrec. PPE last week, 
Uh, I gave you the numbers. 10.4 million units of PPE was where we were last week. We now have 11 million. There's additional 600,000 PPE that has come into our stock. So we really, really appreciate that we are, we are bringing in more PPE. So we now have 11 million P units of PPE. But we still have the order that, that is there. So we are receiving PPE uh, as and when uh, that PPE comes. We want to continue to say that a lot of PPE is now also being manufactured locally because we are conscious, deliberate about it, uh, where our industrial capacity exists in South Africa to manufacture PPE. We should encourage our local industries to manufacture PPE, including township-based businesses, black businesses, uh, all kind of businesses we have that are Houghton-based, we're encouraging them. Uh, our team for, led by our treasury department, uh, when they do procurement of PPE, they know that we also want to stimulate industrialization and local manufacturing. That's a policy position. We don't apologize for that at all. Uh, and that includes procurement of masks uh, that should be made locally by small businesses, by, by township businesses. Uh, the masks that we are procuring for the, our children when the schools uh, reopen, uh, those masks are being made by township businesses uh, locally. Uh, well, that's the indication of what we have with PPE units there, uh, the different type of PEE, PPE, the different, uh, so the stock we have of 11 11 million PPE, the breakdown is there of the different face PPE, body PPE, hand PPE, the respiratory PPE, the tools, particularly the tools for using when operations have to be uh, undertaken in the hospitals, but also environmental related uh, PPE uh, for our environmental teams that have to go and decontaminate our public spaces, the taxi ranks, uh, the residential and open spaces across the province. I want to, so we are sharing with you the maps. Back to the maps that we were talking about. So this is, we have mapped here the different parts of Gauteng where the income level is below the poverty line. Make, this is an important area for interventions on food security and the income grant, uh, the special income grant, poverty income grant. So we show you where a lot of people are really, really finding it hard. Uh, it informs our strategy on social security intervention. We also map unemployment. We mapped for you from the beginning cases. We're mapping now poverty, we are, now, we are also mapping unemployment in the different areas of Gauteng. We're mapping that for you. And socioeconomic status, uh, basically, for the different areas. I think we're also saying to you, the people who are, who, who are calling for help with food parcels uh, are principally the unemployed. 67% of those uh, people who are requesting food parcels are the unemployed. Uh, and that's where the, direct, the, di the direction of the special COVID grant is going. So those people who have been asking for food security are people who literally have no income. And we also show you the heat map across the different parts of the province in the different regions. The heat map that tells you the requests are coming from different areas of Gauteng. Uh, this is already mapped. We look at the request. We, we have mapped that on, uh, on our heat map to, to inform and direct interventions. There must be evidence-led interventions, not arbitrary political decision-making. We're taking food there and not there. And that's how we are distributing food in our province. It is directed by ba basically science, uh, our Houghton City Region Observatory, maps for us the different areas in Gauteng of greatest need. So that vulnerability is an important way that informs where we should be going. 
then household numbers i don't want to waste your time on this uh, this one so i want to go to the slide that shows you how many people we have distributed food to as of now in the between the last briefing on thursday last week and this briefing so we have distributed 103767 food parcels and have therefore been able to impact on food security of half a million people, 518,835 people. Half a million people have been able to benefit since the start of the lockdown from our food security intervention. And this, again, want to emphasize, is directed at those who require greatest need. We, are not, we want to say we are not reaching everybody. There are still people who are saying we have not been able to receive food because the demand is higher than we are able to meet uh, this demand. Uh, we want to continue to thank those who are supporting this initiative from businesses, civil society groups, and foundations, uh, the food security effort is a very, very important intervention related to COVID. Uh, we, are, we are continuing to do work on the e-voucher. Shelters, the homeless people. Uh, our story with the homeless people is the same. The number we are able to provide food to, three meals a day, is 3,251. Uh, across the province, they are in 48 shelters that we have provided. Um, uh, and, and one important thing is that uh, we we'll continue to report. At other times, the number of the homeless uh, decreases, others leave, and then they come back later uh, to the shelters. Uh, but we continue to attend to those. We also provide in some programs to those, including skills development programs, uh, to the to the people in this home in the in these shelters, the homeless people in these shelters are being trained in various uh, skills to to enhance their employability or their ability to be able to earn incomes uh, for themselves. I want to conclude with the area of law enforcement. So you remember we said we have. We have been able to reach 3.4 million people for screening. But if you, if you add into that 3.4 million, we also, through the roadblocks that we have conducted throughout the province, uh, during the period that was the window period, and even after, we continue to do roadblocks. We are doing screening on the roads. We are also doing testing. We have screened an additional 200 and 40,000 people at the roadblocks and tested 3,429 people. So the roadblocks are also used for, for doing the health intervention. They are not just for policing uh, the regulations only, but even on the roadblocks, we check, we have our healthcare workers working with the police there to do. That is why our screening numbers is 3.6 million. So remember it said 3.4 million is in the institutions and in the communities and 240,000 is on the roads. Uh, so our screening program is, uh, is, is bigger because it's taking place literally uh, everywhere. What is our principal focus during level four? Firstly is to enforce the regulations of level four. The president last night announced that by the end of May, uh, we would like to move to level three, but he announced that it would not be for everybody where the infection rate is still very, very high. Those areas may be left out of that. But I want to say to you, this is what we are doing to enforce level four now. So we are focusing on level four in Gaute. Firstly, remember what we shared with you that they are imaging hotspots. They are imaging hotspots. So when we think about the townships, we're thinking of the, the spaces where the likelihood of inf higher infections are going to take place. Firstly, it's in the malls. So the retail sector is seen 
as a high-risk sector. In the Western Cape, the cluster outbreaks, a lot of them took place in the retail and workplaces. So it is for that reason that we are now focusing on the malls in Gaute. So we have identified all the malls in the suburbs, uh, the malls in the townships as the areas of high risk. In other words, because large numbers of people interact, go to the malls in larger numbers. And we are enforcing, we have met the team from economic development as well as health, has met with the managers of the malls in Gaute. What are we enforcing there? The first thing we are enforcing is to ensure that every mall has got a compliance officer and every mall manager takes responsibility for the following things that must happen in all the shops in that mall. Every shop without exception which is open. Every business that's open in line with level four Firstly, ensure that there is social distancing in the shops. And that's what we were doing yesterday, checking. And then that everybody comes into the mall only when they, are, they have a mask. And that there's sanitizers uh, in there. But also there's disinfection of those areas. Uh, continuous disinfection of those areas and proper access control to ensure that the area there that is a mall, high high concentration of people, where people gather there. That area is itself taken care of. So it doesn't become a source of a cluster outbreak of COVID-19. So we're focusing on, we are going to be doing this essentially. Every week we will be picking up unannounced visits. We're not informing the, the mall managers when we get there. We do unannounced visits. Sometimes we get tips from uh, even about shops from members of the public. There's a pick and pay there or there is a, a spa there. They say to us, go to that shop. They, they are not complying. Uh, so we do that. And I must give you feedback. Yesterday's uh, interaction by our provincial executive council with the malls in Gauteng, those that we identified, Soshanguve uh, is one of them. The... the, the I, I'm, I'm satisfied that they are taking steps to put in place all the measures. Social distancing, uh, ensuring that people don't come into the shops to buy unless they have masks. But they're also protecting the workers. Every shop that is open is protected. Give the workers there have PPE themselves. So the, the feedback we have from the shops throughout the province is that there's very good imaging you remember, we use the word imaging because it's relative, it's not absolute. Imaging levels of compliance. And, and I want to commend the businesses. I want to commend the mall managers. I want to commend those uh, shop owners in the malls who are cooperating with us, who are putting these measures in place. Because the only way to defeat COVID is really if all of us take the measures seriously uh, and work comprehensively, and don't leave this to the police. It's not, it's not the job of the police to, get, to ensure that we wear masks. And, and I must emphasize, wear masks properly. Uh, yesterday, I wore my mask, which was too small, and I was called to order by tweet, the Twitterati. My mask was too small. It was leaving out the nose. Uh, today, I have a proper mask, uh, which uh, covers my full nose. Uh, and uh, everywhere, we, we, need to, we need to really ensure that the citizen participation in social, it may be difficult to do social distancing in a shack, but we can, we can put in place lots of ways to ensure that we, we really, really minimize the spread. Even those who live in shacks, even those who live in informal settlements themselves can take measures. We have seen it. A lot more people are wearing masks. Uh, we're seeing that a lot more people are wearing masks. But there are still places, I'm worried, where people are just going about where, go, doing their business as if COVID-19 is not there. So the malls and the retail sector, big challenge. Uh, we are hitting that sector hard until there's full compliance. The second area is public transport. The public transport system 
is vulnerable for, for increasing uh, because that's where people come into contact. So sanitization, disinfection of our public transport systems, compliance with the numbers being lower, from the how train to the taxis to the buses, all of them, we are also focusing on them. We are, foc we are working with the, with the sector, the taxi industry in particular. I must commend the taxi industry in Gauteng. They are really, really cooperating a lot with us uh, in this effort to ensure there's disinfection of the taxis every day. No one comes into the taxi without a mask. This is really the only way we can defeat COVID is if we work the way we are working with the malls, the way we are working with the taxi industry. We want to go to other sectors of the economy. We are going to be visiting firms that are open. We also want to make sure that they comply. Uh, but we're also enforcing something that for a long time government has been ignoring, environmental health standards. So we, when we get to these shops, we also check if there are businesses that are selling expired, expired food stuff, and in particular, uh, rotten meat. Now, MEC Mazbuko has the luck. Every time she goes to an area, she's able to come out of that place, uh, having closed down one shop because they are selling rotten meat or expired food stuff. This is the work outside COVID. Government is supposed to be doing this work. And I, I am sorry to admit that government has not been doing this work to enforce environmental health standards. Our municipalities, uh, our compliance departments have not been doing their work. They've been sleeping on the job, basically. And communities now are alive. They are able to tip us. That shop, I got a tip. I sent MEC Mazubuko that tip. I was tipped that there is a shop in Alexandra that is selling expired goods. I sent that information. I got that from Twitter, by the way. I get lots of information from Twitter. I got that information, passed it to MEC Mazubuko, and she hit that place and found that, indeed, they were selling expired food stuff there. And... What you do, they have to close down. Uh, and that's what we're doing. This normal work we are supposed to be doing. But sometimes government does not work the way it's supposed to work. So COVID-19 is also an opportunity to fix the things we have not been doing uh, as government and to be responsive to community complaints, uh, citizen complaints, and citizen grievances. Whenever they identify the problem, uh, we want to respond. I want to conclude by saying we must all play our part. We must, we must slow down the spread of COVID-19. Uh, it is clear, all evidence from the scientists says we will, we will reach several waves, we will reach the peak, but the difference is things that we can do ourselves. Uh, so the peak is, is coming. Uh, the disease is spreading. The virus and the, its disease are spreading to different areas of Gauteng, no area of Gauteng where people must think it will not come, it will come, but the issue is what do we do to make sure that we save lives and ensure that we reduce uh, the number of people who are going to be impacted, including those who may pass on. So there are things we can do, uh, and those things we can do are the golden rules, basically, social distancing, uh, we must put on the face masks, those of us who are not health workers. Uh, we must sanitize our hands. We must wash our hands as many times as we can. And we must ensure that all the open spaces are sanitized and disinfected. Uh, we must ensure that the businesses that are open comply. Uh, indeed, we want to reopen the economy. We want more people to be able to earn their incomes. We want businesses to be able to work, uh, but we're not going to be reckless about it. We're not going to just do it at all costs. We must do it in phases. And we in Gauteng are using level four, basically to ensure that all the sectors comply. And when they comply with level four and these measures are in place, it will help us to get to level three, to just think we can just get to level three without these measures being 
in place, it will be a dangerous risk. Uh, it is for that reason that we say, and in Gauteng, I want to conclude by saying, we are an integrated, highly integrated city region, highly integrated economy. In Gauteng, you can't have level three in Ekuruleni and level one in Johannesburg and level two in Swane. These are integrated, we are an integrated city region. People move, they work and live in, in these spaces simultaneously. Others live in Joburg, but they work in Swan. Uh, some work in Ekuruleni, but they live in Johannesburg. Uh, even the people who live in the, in the districts, in the West End, and in City Bay, most of them work in our city, in the core city region. So if, if any one of you was to ask a question, how are you going to treat these uh, integrated areas, we are going to ensure that we lower. It's only when we are satisfied that there is full compliance in the province that we will make a case for going to level three. We will make a case for going to level two. We will make a case. So we, we are working as one because it is true that we are a single economy. Uh, if you don't manage Houghton that way and think that the people in Ekurulene are separated from the people in Johannesburg, you are likely to create us again as an epicenter. And that's what we want to avoid. Uh, again, we share with you Impilo app. Uh, please use this app. We are amongst those jurisdictions in the world. Uh, there are countries in Asia that has, have used technology very effectively. Uh, South Korea, uh, Vietnam, use technology effectively to be able to ensure that we are able to track, uh, but also get people to self to to self-screen and be able to get feedback from citizens on this. This is something that we really, really want to encourage uh, that you use it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the long and short of it is the, the hotspots are shifting. We want to get there early enough in those areas that are emerging as new hotspots. We don't want to wait until the, the density of cases are too much to overwhelm our system. That's where we are directing our food security, where we are directing our tracing and testing. We are driven by science and evidence. We are not just doing a random thing. Uh, like those who like to criticize us want to believe that we're just doing a random thing. We have our problems and others must look at their own problems. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, uh, Premier. We will now uh, take uh, questions. Um, do I see a hand? Okay. Can the mic go over there so that we can get the questions? Uh, While we're taking the questions, can somebody come and attend to the computer here? Work. The one that feeds the uh, lectern screen. Uh, Premier, it's uh, Ndaezo from Power, Power FM. Uh, on that last point that you made uh, on levels, when you look at the numbers, the Gauteng numbers, it looks uh, impressive. It looks like you are, being, you are able to maintain it and you are doing well. Now, the president last night made pronouncements on the issue of moving certain regions. Uh, it wasn't specific on whether it was municipalities or provinces to level three. What would your preference as the premier, taking into consideration all dynamics, the fact that you are currently doing well, would the preference be to stay at level four until you are satisfied, or are you satisfied to move to level three? Thank you. Okay, next one. Um, uh, Sipa from Newsroom Africa. So, okay, um, my colleague has already asked uh, my first question. 
Uh, now, my second question is around what you had stated that uh, social distancing is an issue in townships. I mean, we saw that uh, in Ivory Park and Soshanguve yesterday when we were out with you. Now, you said that the, some of the numbers of uh, confirmed cases in uh, Ivory Park were removed to quarantine sites because they could not self-isolate, um, self-quarantine rather. So would this be a plan maybe for high-density areas or maybe people or families that aren't able to, to, to self-quarantine, as you said, that in some cases they have, you have intergenerational uh, families living under one roof and normally it's a small-sized house. So would this be the plan, even if the symptoms are not high, to remove them to another quarantine site? Okay. Um, all right, do you have other questions? I don't see any. Oh, oh. oh sorry, one more. Oh. Yeah, okay, oh, go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to ask on um, the recent numbers of uh, arrests for contravening regulations so far. Have there okay. been any? <laughs> All right, that's fine. We'll provide that. Uh, right, uh, before we answer, I just want to check some of the questions that we received via WhatsApp. One is from uh, the record newspaper. Sinesipo, uh, please, okay, the questions uh, on social development. Here the question says the Democratic Alliance in Gauteng has claimed that uh, there are delays in the distribution of uh, food parcels and that some of the people who are desperately in need of food during this national lockdown uh, have not yet received any food due to delays in the distribution. Some of the people were said to have applied for food parcels a month ago and have not yet uh, had any response from the Department of Social Development. Please do clarify the matter of how, how is the food parcel distribution program going uh, two, is there any delays in the distribution process? But you've already said there are delays. Three, on an average, how many parcels uh, do we distribute? Four, what is being what what is being insured? What what is being done to ensure that NGOs have permit to distribute food? so they can assist uh, in the distribution. Then there are also um, uh, further questions from the same journalist. With a localized lockdown uh, expected to be implemented after the cabinet, uh, what, is the, what is being done to ensure that more community-based tests are conducted? And then there's a question from Homo from Eyewitness News. What role, if any, has the use of cell phone towers uh, played a role, I mean, uh, um, assisted in the tracing? Uh, from the same journalist, please explain the decision to have mass testing at malls and shopping centers. I think we have dealt with that, but we can further elaborate on that. Then there's a question from uh, Jacob Roy from Rapport. Why must NGOs provide details about food distribution to the Department of Social mm -hmm. Development? Uh, they are even required to provide ID numbers, addresses, and contact numbers of the people they are distributing food to. Okay, yeah. That's the questions we have from WhatsApp. We will answer. Uh, who would like to start? MC Masuku or MC Lisuf wants to start. Thank you so much, uh, Premier. Thank you so much, Tabo. Let's deal with the claims by other political parties that uh, 
we are delaying in the distribution of food. I think the statistics that have been provided by our Premier indicates that indeed we are distributing food. Almost half a million Gaudian uh, people have received food parcels. The reality is the demand is high than what we can afford to provide. We are ramping up. There are two proposals currently on the table. We are trying to distribute almost 4,000 food parcels per region uh, every month. Currently, we are distributing 1,200 per month uh, per region, so we are ramping it up to 4,000. And with the assistance of the institutions that the Premier have indicated that are assisting us, uh, averagely now, we are distributing almost between 2,000 and 3,000 3, food parcels per day across our province. That is why we really believe that, and the, I think the Premier correctly captured it, that majority of the people that needed food parcels were unemployed. Now that we have the unemployed uh, meant grant uh, or the COVID-19 grant, we're encouraging people to apply for that grant. Thus far, 3.2 million people have applied for that grant, and majority of the people that have applied for that grant are coming from Gauteng. So we are pleased that our people are, are, are applying for that grant because come the 15th of May, that grant will start to pay people and that will uh, uh, alleviate the pressures that we are having in terms of the, uh, the, the request for food parcels. The question from report, why NGOs must provide details and the addresses of people that wish to avoid duplication, basically. Uh, we don't want a certain NGO to provide to the same family. A certain church can provide to the same family. Government comes provide for the same family. A local business person can provide for the same family. We don't have any malicious intent. It's for purpose of coordination and for purpose of ensuring that the right people get the relevant support that we all want to provide. At no particular stage will stop any NGO from providing uh, whatever that they want to provide. We just want to coordinate and bring the military, uh, the army if possible, or the police during distribution because what we have witnessed that if we don't have law enforcement agencies, uh, you have people fighting over food and that creates problems. So our request therefore is to coordinate. It's not to, uh, to steal the thunder or take over the distribution from the institutions that wants to make those distributions. But we want to emphasize uh, that if we coordinate and work together and we understand where the need is, we can collectively ensure that ordinary South Africans are assisted and we can provide the kind of support that is needed uh, in our communities. Thank you so much, Prim. Thanks. Thank you. I will, I will attempt to talk about the, the issues relating to our hotspots and, and, and maybe the issue that we need to, to determine in terms of uh, how are we going to move from level three to level four, because there is a particular criteria that has been announced by the World Health Organization, which we need to take into account before we decide on anything. And I think we like to also say as the Gauden government that it will be important that our determination of levels must always be uh, uh, de uh, uh, determined in a manner that will include all our uh, districts and our municipalities at, at, you know, at a goal. And the, the World Health Organization had actually reflected that um, we need to be able to demonstrate as a province, at least, you know, that our, our public are well educated uh, in terms of preventative uh, uh, methods and, and, and habits. And also we should demonstrate that we, we have a better control of imported uh, cases. You know, those who come from other provinces or come from other countries. And we also have to put into place measures, you know, as you'd all know that the debate about schools uh, you know, has come up and also us in terms of the debate about our own GPG facilities opening up. So we need to also demonstrate that we are able 
to prevent any spread and transmission uh, around our, our buildings and also minimize uh, outbreaks, you know, meaning that we have to focus on the hotspots as we have been doing and uh, minimize uh, these uh, outbreaks as we see them or as they emerge. And also we have to demonstrate and see our ability to screen, trace, treat uh, those who are infected in that regard. And I think that's what we need to be able to do. So we need to demonstrate those and we need to meet those criteria for us to be able to move any further in terms of the levels. But I think the issue is that we, we have the ability at the moment, you know, because of the numbers that we have, that we are comfortable with of making sure that we are able to isolate those individuals who require isolation uh, from their own uh, houses or from their own informal settlements. And it's something that we have been doing in Dripslot, it's something that we have been doing in Ivory Park and some other areas in the Lenezia South and uh, in Dobsonville. And I think the issue of hotspots, they will remain. You know, we, we, we are going to continuously have daily screening and testing in our uh, shopping malls and shopping centers. There is agreement that has been reached with uh, some of them, if not all, uh, which they are going to join and give us space to make sure that we are able to, to screen and, and further test those who actually qualify for testing. And like the Premier have said, we are not going to forget that we still have to meet our 1990 target in terms of HIV and AIDS and TB. So also the t part of our screening and testing also relates to our, our target to reach in terms of AIDS, HIV and AIDS. And I think we also want to say that part of our focus on hotspot will also involve our partners, uh, partnerships that we have actually, uh, actually formed and uh, we have agreed on particularly the civil society movement called COVID Front, which is led uh, by all the netlex structures and all the SANAC structures, which now are aimed at dealing with uh, actually COVID. I also want to add something on the issue of PPE, that our adequacy of PPE and usage is, we are closely in consultation and in discussion with all our labor unions, particularly those who are recognized uh, labor unions, and we also want to welcome the innovations that we normally see in our facilities uh, in terms of uh, PPE and its usage and even the adjustment and repurposing of some of them. We know that as at the current moment we are discussing and almost finalizing the usage of the face shield for all our healthcare workers who be that over and above the mask, they have to have, to have a protective uh, a, a barrier, which is a face shield called the visor, so that those are things that we provide. We also have additional innovations, you know, in Charlotte Macleke, we have seen the intro box uh, that was uh, actually seen and, the, you know, the president was uh, actually um, happy with it. Uh, in Steve Biko this morning in social media, they've demonstrated, uh, because we normally buy aprons which are not that effective in protecting our healthcare workers and healthcare workers, uh, particularly uh, infectio infectious uh, professors, have actually now made a refuse bag something that can be useful to cover more uh, in terms of the apron. And these are innovations and adjustments that we actually welcome uh, as part of us making sure that we allay the fears and allay the anxiety of our healthcare workers. And lastly, the issue of hospital facilities is that we will get in one time or one day at a time, we will have facilities which will have whether infected uh, uh, individuals or patients or infected healthcare workers. One thing that we need to uh, allay the fears of the public is that protocols and steps get taken for us to be able to trace all the contacts of those individuals, also to de decontaminate you know, the facility. It doesn't make sense that all the time we have to uh, uh, make it a, a, an alarm uh, in the point that even people want to strike and close the facility. It is part of the SOP that decontamination will happen over a period of time. People will be tested, people will be screened, and those who are affected will be uh, actually um, not allowed to work and, until they actually they've been cleared. So those protocols are there, and I think we should get used to them 
because it's something that will be happening throughout, not only in health facilities, but in all the other uh, public uh, uh, you know, sports. And maybe lastly, it's just to also uh, indicate that uh, we pass our sincere condolences to the family of uh, Dr. Mini, who was a chairperson of our uh, committee, which was advising the MEC on accreditation and facility on quality assurance. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mine. I'll just respond to uh, the arrest so far. How are we looking here in Gauteng? Uh, there are various offenses, of course, as part of uh, the ongoing law enforcement that does happen, as part of our crime law operations and a, a contravention of the Disaster Management Act. Uh, there's been quite a lot of uh, alcohol and liquor that has been uh, confiscated. So obviously those that then are, fo those that fo are found uh, even brewing uh, illegal uh, alcohol also get arrested. Uh, those that are still uh, are selling uh, illicit cigarettes, uh, uh, those also uh, get uh, uh, arrested because they're in possession of um, things that they're not supposed to be carrying. And uh, we have received quite a lot of tips also of people who are selling uh, cigarettes, uh, taxi ranks, um, and we warn all those that are selling Shoshapansi um, that uh, their days are numbered. We have their names. Nizoz and Genesis Babopil. Uh, there's been also those that have been arrested for possession of illegal firearms, uh, those that uh, have been doing illegal gathering, like uh, in areas where majorities were informal settlements, where people just work energy, abuse meeting, and uh, allege that there's going to be uh, evictions, which is something that is not necessarily happening. Even those that are, blockade, uh, are blocking the roads, uh, for various uh, protests, bafunu kesi, bafuna manzi, uh, bafuna gonke. Instead of engaging the councillor to say uh, we are having, uh, we are experiencing a challenge, there are those that have been arrested for car hijackings. Uh, don't think I'm a criminal as a lele over civil lockdown. But some people are going to and they also get arrested. Uh, drug lords also. Uh, this time we are not going for uh, small Indian foot soldiers. Even the kingpins are actually uh, arrested. So, but thinking that no gune lockdown ama is our hand. Out of our wanted lists, we were sitting at 80,000 in Gauteng. We've reduced that number to almost 50,000. So almost 30,000 have been arrested for various crimes, those that were actually uh, uh, wanted. Uh, GPV cases also, there are some people who have been arrested even for rapes. Uh, social crime prevention, which is ongoing, that police uh, do, those that are breaking the curfew, wish to uh, remind our Gauteng citizens that there's curfew between 8 p.m. at night and 5 a.m. in the morning. Uh, because now there is this challenge, uh, you can't be seen uh, walking at night. Uh, so uh, please, let us continuously remind each other that do not be found on the wrong side of the law. Uh, the only people who are allowed is those that are essential service, obviously your uh, health workers uh, or though, or, uh, and those that are, are providing uh, essential service. Uh, those that are like uh, drivers from Patco, they wake up uh, very early and revive. They wake up very early in order to go and get a bus from the depot and start picking up people as early as 5 a.m. So we wish to urge our people, would you please uh, take care of yourselves. We're sitting plus minus at 30,000 of all these mixed uh, cases because obviously uh, Tsotsis will continue trying their luck and uh, attempting to uh, buckle some of the properties and those that will be doing all the wrong things. We thank you very much.
thank you very much uh, for those uh, responses. I just want to elaborate a little bit and, uh, so on our road to uh, level three. Uh, the first thing I want to emphasize is that we will get to level three together. Uh, it is not going to be a magic wand. Just one morning, wake up, we say we motivate. I would like the people of our province to know that the greater levels of compliance with uh, all the measures, many of us uh, in the communities wearing our face masks, uh, the public transport system, uh, all the businesses complying, just at level four. If we can comply at level four, we will be able to move to level three much, much quicker. Uh, because if, if we can't have compliance at level four, and we go to level three, we're going to be overwhelmed, essentially, uh, without that. So I, I, I want to emphasize that uh, the, next, the next two weeks are crucial for us uh, as Houghton province. The next two weeks, all the sectors that need to be complying, uh, community level, the next two weeks are crucial. The next two weeks are also crucial for us. We are watching what will be happening with the numbers, these numbers we're sharing with you about the hotspots, we're watching uh, what will be happening with these numbers in different places. Uh, but we can only get to level three out of a lot of sweat uh, that we put into level four. Uh, because there is no magic about it. More social distancing. Uh, and we... we as the economic hub of our, uh, of our country, uh, we would like the economy to open. We know what the full impact of that is on the livelihoods of, uh, of millions of people, uh, many of whom have come to Gauteng from the different parts of our country for economic reasons, to, in order to be able to earn an income and feed their families. Uh, many of the small businesses in our province are not are not operating now, or even of those that are operating, they are not operating at a level uh, that uh, will ensure the, the sustainable livelihoods. I was uh, joking earlier on uh, uh, when I talked about the, the saloons, but the guys uh, who are in small business are really, really suffering hard. Even the guys who are in a uh, who are in, in, in various areas of small businesses are, are having it tough. And the businesses that are closed, I want to say that with the reason we, we want level three is because we, sh we, we would like every business that uh, operates to have this st a standard. Uh, I want to go to my uh, head, ha hairdresser uh, haircut guy because hairdresser sounds too sophisticated. The guy just cut my hair. It's not as sophisticated as that. He just cut. I want to. I want to go to him uh, and be sure that everybody that that small outfit complies. Uh, the women who have been looking at some of them, my colleagues are complaining about their nails, uh, that they are really suffering. I want to be sure when that business opens where they do their nails, because those are contact businesses. If someone who cuts your hair, your, your hair, it's contact businesses. We want, yeah, we want these businesses to be open, but there must be in place measures to protect uh, uh, people. So I... I don't want anyone to be thinking that we are just enjoying the fact that the economy is closed. We can't. Uh, we can't. We're not enjoying being in level four. We would like to move to level three, but we are realistic people. We are, we are pragmatic people. We would like to move to level one. It doesn't matter uh, to be calling the economy must close. 
uh, when we are not entertaining the issue, how do we make sure that as we, as we open the economy, because uh, no one benefits from the, a, an economy that is closed, uh, lockdown measures, uh, measures you resort to, extreme measures you resort to, not because it is nice, uh, but we want to open the economy. But when we do so, I think we don't want to, to wake up one morning, there is a cluster of out, uh, pandemic, sources of pandemic uh, outbreaks. We don't want to wake up one morning that now we, so far we have been managing, so you are right, we have been managing at least since uh, the lockdown, level five lockdown, we have been managing fewer and fewer cases. But we know, all signs say the road ahead is still tough. Uh, we, there's winter, uh, there's this pandemic has got its own logic. It has got this peak or several peaks. Now it is said it will actually go over. It's more, it's more than just a year. It's something that we will be with over up to two years. The, re, the reason we want, we must do this, we must do everything to, to put in place compliance measures, uh, social distancing, is to just return to the new normal as as quickly as possible. But I, I worry that there are areas where people just don't comply. And they may be the, the ones that uh, drag us uh, into these uh, areas. If there is a suburb where there is an outbreak uh, going forward, if you ask me, because in South Africa we have a national command council uh, the Coronavirus Command Council chaired by the President, the decisions will not just be made everywhere. We will, we will go to the National Command Council. Uh, when, when issues are reviewed, we will say this is where Gauteng is. Uh, uh, you know, if the rate, if we were to go at the rate we are going, I've, I've also received lots of questions from people on Twitter. But we seem to be doing well, Premier. Why don't we go to level three? I'm saying if we were to go at the rate we are going, the rate of infections low, uh, mortality rate low, we, we would be able to move beyond level three, actually. Level three is not the, the, it's not the place, actually. The place to go to is level one, is go back to the full operation of the economy. So everyone can contribute. My response, everyone can contribute to us reopening the economy. It's not just going to be a call or a political speech made uh, by a, a leader of a party saying that we must reopen the economy. It's not going to work like that. It is going to work only on the basis that we, have making, we are making such good progress. And it is also true that true that the lockdown will run its course. There will be a level beyond which the lockdown will not work. Uh, there will be a level beyond which we can't maintain level four because there are still too many people who, who are not in work, who are going to otherwise be looking at intervention from us, and we don't have the resources. So, but step by step, uh, the, next, the next few weeks are crucial. Here in Gauteng, we want to make sure that before we, we go to level four, I mean level three, we have all the, all the businesses and the sectors that are operating have full compliance with level four. That is the, the best assurance, the quickest way to go to, to level three is to make sure that all, all the measures that are at level four, what are those measures? We implement social distancing in every establishment. We put in place sanitization in every establishment. We're able to, uh, to, to improve the capability of our facilities to handle a spark or a spike in cases. That if we have more cases that include admissions, 
So, and we are working simultaneously. We are doing these things. I, I am glad by that by the, end of, by the end of May, we will start unveiling the new beds. The new beds that we are building in our existing uh, hospitals, we'll start unveiling them by the end of May. And then the others will be coming uh, in bits and, and, and pieces in that way. So, so essentially, the best assurance to move to a lower levels of the lockdown is not just to make a call. Uh, it's not just to say that we are sick and tired of, of the lockdown. Because the reality is that uh, if we are reckless, we may not have an opportunity to be sick and tired because we will be dead. You know, when you are dead, you can't be sick and tired of anything. And, and I, we have the responsibility to work with the people of our, our, our province. Uh, work with, uh, I want to emphasize, we are working very well with certain sectors of business already. An example is the retail sector. If the retail sector, if what the retail sector has agreed with us is implemented, and if all the sectors implement what the retail sector is doing, proper social self-policing, proper social distancing in the, in, the, in the shops, PPE for workers, we will get many of these uh, sectors open quite, quite soon, including uh, the place where I cut my hair, uh, including that place, because I do want that place to be open. And I'm not going to cut my hair until that place is open. I'm told, and the dry clean. I don't mind about the dry clean, but I mind about my hair. I think we have answered all your questions, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. I can see Amy Silisuf has tried, but his head is really messed up. He's just demolished his head. Is there a question she asked we didn't deal with? Thank you so much.